If anybody has anything from chapter 10 that you saw in the course of your reviewing or whatever's. If you don't, that's cool. I'm just, you know, just presenting an option. Yeah, Luke. You number 68. 68? Yeah, sure. So 68, we have R secant theta is equal to negative 3. So I would first observe that secant is theta is 1 over cosine theta. And I'll get the R by itself by multiplying both sides by cosine theta. And then we'll multiply both sides by R. So here we have x squared plus y squared. And here we have negative 3x. I'll move that over. and then complete the square here. So I'm going to be adding 3 over 2 squared to both sides. So that's going to be x plus 3 over 2 quantity squared plus y squared equals 9 fourths. Does that feel okay? Um, again, the, the tricky part here would have been deciding to try to separate the R and the secant theta and putting those on to opposite sides. Until the last, like, the answer. Oh. I just didn't put it in Oh, okay. Okay. You feel good, though? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, anybody else happy to do some more? It's okay if you don't have anything. Uh, Blake. Uh, Ninety four. Sure. So this is just going to be um, using the facts about rose curves or Limasan curves. So the First thing that I'd want to do here is identify whether this is a rose curve or Limasan curve. I can tell because it's in the form a plus or minus sine theta that it's a Limasan curve where the a is 1 and the b is 4. Remember for Limasan curves the a and b are always positive. Um, so what do we ask here? The well, the domain is easy. The domain for either Limasan or uh, Rose curves is all real numbers. The minimum value is um, a minus b, so negative three, and the maximum value is a plus b. So 5, so my range goes then from negative 3 to positive 5. Um, for this type of Limasan curve, I have to look at A over B, which is 1 fourth. And since that's less than 1, that tells me this is the inner loop type of Limasan curve. And all Limasan curves um, are either symmetric about the x or y axis. And since this is a uh, sine one, I know it's just symmetric about the y axis. The uh, Cosine ones are symmetric about the x-axis. For Limasan, rose curves are it's different. But 
I think that's all the details that it asked for up there, right? Yeah. There's no pedals for Lemus on, so I think I got everything else. Cool. And again, like if you're like, uh, what are you getting all those formulas and stuff from? Well, it was just, uh, yeah. you know, I'm just using these details about Lemasan curves from the notes last time or two times ago. Yep. Uh, anybody else? Anise? 83? Sure. So here we're trying to go from this rectangular curve to a polar curve. So I would start by just expanding both of these parentheses, so foiling everything out. I'm going to do that just like kind of in my head. That's okay with you. Oh my goodness, not 121 there, dopey McDoperson, that's negative 22. And that's a Y, not an X. Anyways, does that feel so far so good? Yeah. All right. I'm going to move the constants all to one side. I'm going to observe that x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. I'm going to recall that x is equal to r cosine theta. And I'm going to remember that y is equal to r sine theta. So far, so good. Okay, I'm going to move the, or get the r squared by itself. So just add the other two over, and then divide by r. And that'll do her. Now, why is it okay to divide by r here? Because I know that r is not negative. So it's def or non zero, excuse me. Since r is representing the, you know, the radius of this circle, right? So clearly not zero, since that's a circle that exists. Okie dokie. Cool. Uh, Blake. Um, okay, so this is a clarification question. Sure, go right for, ahead. Like, um, when you find a parameterization for um, like a line segment. Okay. Um, so when you, uh, you like your uh, parameters would be like either zero and zero one or negative one zero, right? Uh, yeah. So if we have some points, yep. um, our function would be potentially n 
and Blake's just asking for this, what the parameter here is going to be. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Sneezes come in threes, so we should be good, right? <laughs> Cross our fingers. Um, oh my goodness. So Blake, we can check which parameter we want to use or which interval we want to use um, just by plugging in either negative one or positive one. So okay. for example, if I plug in negative one, I get CD, which is a point. which is what I'm looking for. And we, we plug it into both equations, right? Into T. So this is a T, right? Oops. So negative 1 is a T, so I plug it into all the Ts. Okay. When I evaluate the first one, I get C. And I evaluate the Y, I get D. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Does that feel good? It doesn't matter whether you want to check the negative one or the positive one. Either it works or it doesn't. If it doesn't work, it's the other one. If it works, it's that one. Yeah. So like, and that's again, that's relying on you using, you know, the vector equation for a line to get that parameterization. If you didn't do that then finding the parameters is considerably more difficult. Not impossible, it can still be done, but it's a pain in the tuchus and we didn't talk about how to do it. But you could write the equation for a line using like y equals mx plus b. And then you have to figure out, okay, like, you know, like the first value has to give me a, B, the first value of T that I have, has to give me that. The second value of T has to give me, you know, C, D. And you could figure that out. It wouldn't be so bad, but I think you'd end up having to solve a system, which is just like more work than it needs to be, man. Yeah, I just want to make, I want to point out to you that like doing it the obvious way will work, right? Using the vector equation for line just makes finding that interval a lot trivial. Yeah, it's just a guess and check, you know. All righty, we feel okay. Let's uh, chapter 11 it then, huh? So chapter 11 is one that realistically I could finish this in a day. I'm not, we're not going to do that, but mostly because I just don't want to have like basically two back-to-back -back tests, but this is not a big chapter. Um, I don't think it's a terribly difficult chapter either, but it's newish. All right. Um, so recall we talked last year about the imaginary number i. What's that imaginary number i equal to? square root of negative 1, which is equivalent to saying i squared is equal to negative 1. Yeah, sure. Everybody's okay with that? And so then we had the set of complex numbers that we defined last year. This was the set of things in the form a plus bi such that a and b are real numbers and i is that imaginary number. Everybody 
Everybody's okay with that? And we have um, no, there's no uh, ordering for the complex numbers. By that I mean like if we ask to um, uh, order from smallest to biggest, maybe we should say least to greatest. That's really what I want to say. If I had the numbers 2 plus 3i and then 3 plus 2i and like the numbers 5i, uh, there's nothing really to do. Like what one should do is the least one, which one is the greatest one? Yeah, you can't do it, right? Um, so like there's no number line that I can put the complex numbers on. So we can't put those, the complex numbers, on a number line like we can the real numbers, right? If I give you 0.87, 5 sixths, and, you know, 7 ninths, you could order those, right? You just convert them all into decimals, and we know how to do that. You know what I mean? Can't do that for complex numbers, though. Um, so well, what, do we, what do we do with them, then? Um, So instead of having being able to place the numbers on a line, we have to place the complex numbers in a plane. We call this the complex plane. The horizontal axis, we're going to call the real axis. So it's going to represent our A's from our complex number. And the vertical axis, we call the complex or the imaginary axis. Cheapers, creepers, Kulik. And our BIs go on that axis. So for example, let's just plot a couple of complex numbers. So if I want to plot 2 plus 3i, my a is 2 and my b is 3i. So I go 2 
2 over and 3i up. So there's that one. If I want to plot negative 2 uh, minus 4i, my a value is negative 2 and my b value is negative 4i. So I go negative 2 on the over and negative 4i down. Everybody's okay with that idea? So, um, this gives me a model for how I would do addition or subtraction of complex numbers. So, for example, if I wanted to do Two plus three i plus negative two minus four i. We're going to go two over and three i up, and then we'll go two to the left and four i down. So the result there appears to be 0, negative 1i, which is exactly what you'd get if you take the real parts and add them together, and you take the imaginary parts and add them together. So basically you can add complex numbers just like you, you would add like a variable expression, right? Does that feel okay? Subtraction will work similarly, right? All right, how about absolute value? So if I have a real number A, what do we mean by the absolute value of A? What is the absolute value of A representing? Okay, the distance from A a to zero on the number line. Okay, very good. So for some complex number z, what is the absolute value of z going to mean? It's the distance from z to what do we how do we plot complex numbers? We use the plane. So what part of the complex plane is going to act like the number zero does on the number line? The origin, yeah.
So what does this mean? So for our complex number z, where z is going to equal a plus bi, the absolute value of z is the same thing as the absolute value of a plus bi, which is just going to be a squared, or the square root of a squared plus b squared. What else, what else might we refer to this square root of a squared plus b squared as? R, yeah. Isn't that the same thing as R in a polar coordinate system? Yeah. But how did you get, um, how did you go from the absolute value of a plus bi to uh, a squared plus b squared? Oh, sure. So here's basically the point a, b. Here's the origin 0, 0. So this distance is going to be the square root of a minus 0 squared plus b minus 0 squared, all square rooted, or just the square root of a squared plus b squared. Right. That's an ag an ag analogous to what we've just described with the complex plane, right? Feel cool? Good question, though. We kind of just skated right past that. Um, just as a an aside here, so. So you can refer to this as the absolute value of z or the modulus of z. So that's another term we use. Um, And the modulus is basically just a more generic term for your distance function. So in a one-dimensional system, the distance is just the absolute value. Right? And in a two-dimensional system, the distance is going to be that distance formula. Right? In a three-dimensional system or a system where distance is defined differently, it might have a different function. But that's just kind of the generic name you give that. Um, everybody's okay with that idea? So alternatively, if this here's my complex number, let's call it z equals a plus bi. We have this. That's the we could also then define this angle, right? What's that angle? gotta be well it's got to be that tan of theta gives me b over a right we call this angle theta the argument. But what have we just kind of described now?
like a polar point representation for Z, right? So we say that the we call this representation the trigonometric form of Z equals A plus B I to B Z equals R times cosine theta plus I sine theta. implying then that A is equal to R cosine theta and B is equal to R sine theta. So let's say we want to take the complex number negative 2 plus 5i and put it in the trigonometric form. We're going to need two things. We're going to need our modulus, which is r. So that's going to be the same as the absolute value of z. So negative 2 squared plus 5 squared, all square rooted, which is the square root of 29. And then to get theta, we're looking for this value where this is negative 2 plus 5i. So this is my alpha. The other side of alpha is 180. So theta is going to equal 180 minus alpha, where alpha is the tan inverse of the absolute value of, in this case, B over A. And I guess let's make a decision about how we're representing that theta. Let's say it's going to be between 0 and 2 pi. So what we get here is um, 1.19. Oh, oops. Uh, one point, oops, 1.9531. So my trigonometric form then is the square root of 29 times cosine of 1.9531 plus I times sine 1.9531.
Uh, So let's say we want to do the reverse. Let's say we want to take a complex number in trigonometric form and want to rewrite it in that standard form, the A plus BI form. We call that form standard form. Well, we'd like to leave this exact if we can. I notice that cosine of 3 pi over 4, that's a unit circle value. right? What's cosine of 3 pi over 4? It's negative square root 2 over 2. And sine of 3 pi over 4 is positive square root 2 over 2. So when I distribute the square root 5 through, I'm done. Mr. Kulak, is it that easy? I mean, it could be easier if I gave you a, you know, like something like 77 degrees or something. You just have to type in your calculator then. <laughs> it might make it even easier. Wouldn't it be like uh, 5 or 10 root, or I root 10 over 2? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Like, forgot to the. No, if you if you catch them, you shout them right out at me. Mr. Kulik makes mistakes every once in a while. He gets excited and he starts going too fast, and he's trying to talk and write at the same time. And does this all feel okay? Nothing too terribly difficult. Um, so let's say we have some complex numbers. I'll call them Z1, Z2, and Z3. And I want to do like Four times z1 minus three times z2 plus ten times z3. What do I do for something like this? Well, I'm just gonna drop in my values for z1, z2, and z3. Distribute things through. And then we'll just combine my like terms. The real parts I can add together to get 18, and the complex parts I can add together to get 24i, and that's all she wrote. What do you guys think? This is pretty easy. Um, worth worth pointing out to you, you can do these operations on your calculator. Um, you'll have to change your mode to make sure you're in the complex mode, that A plus BI mode. But once you've done that, you can do like 4 times 3 minus 6. And then the I button is, where are you at? There it is, second and then the decimal point. So you could do this all on your calculator. 
also. Now, I think the you should be uh, practicing doing this kind of thing by hand because it's not so difficult. But if you wanted to check your answer, once you're in complex number mode, you can do the complex number operations on your calculator. It's worth pointing out that some stuff the calculator doesn't like. So if you try to use that fraction command and put a complex number in there, I think the calculator bucks on that a little bit and says, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. We'll define what division of a complex number means. Um, but I'm going to wait to do that to, uh, to next time because the homework set for just this first section is 40 problems. So like, let's not have 80 problems of homework right from just like a 20 minutes of talking or whatever where I could go and do the next section really fast also, but like, let's not, right? Everybody feel good? Well, it's not due Sunday, because, yeah.